Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it's uh, February the 2nd, and I have a sort of craft talk for our class to make. Um, I'm more or less joining the two workshop groups together. Um, I've decided that our theme, our subject of exploration this semester <clears throat> is pretty clear to me. It's the subject of poetic structure. And uh, <clears throat> clearly narrative has a role in that as one particular point on the spectrum of, of, of structural <clears throat> modalities. Um, and compression is an important subject. We've read the Longenbach essay, uh, of which only the first three or five pages is really useful, the discussion of the ladies' fan poem. <clears throat> and we're discussing your own poems, too. But I want to undertake a pretty specific conversation right, right now today, um, <clears throat> and that is based on uh, some very interesting remarks that were made was made in <clears throat> that were made in one of the papers uh, I got of narrative analysis this last week, and it was Michelle Burke's paper. Um, I loved that Michelle talked about her <clears throat> the primacy for her of the spiritual and the supernatural element in poems. I loved it because those are words that people are usually pretty cautious about using, but <clears throat> they seem sort of quintessentially <clears throat> an element in many poetics. And one of the real reasons that we go to read poems as opposed to all the other kinds of uh, uh, discourse that we have to submit to all the time. Another word for supernatural or for spiritual would, all, would be um, the poetics of mystery. Um, a poetics, an aesthetic, <clears throat> which seeks poems that have a mystery in them. And think about what that means. Um, what that means to me um, right now today is that, is that there's something that is that can't be spoken, that is nonetheless being circumscribed by the poem, framed by the poem and held up for us, preserved, um, contained, and uh, in a certain kind of way, dramatically implemented so that we actually get to experience that sensation that we have of mystery, the mystery of other human beings, uh, the mystery of randomness, the mystery of fate, the, <clears throat> the mystery of ourselves and the ways in which aspects of ourselves are clearly not known or knowable to us, um, all those things. It's a very uh, it's a very worthwhile thing to plant your flag in to say, I care about mystery in poems. I don't care so much about expl explication. I don't care about a rational, meditative, discursive narrator making sense to me. I care about paradox. I care about the way that an image communicates something which really can't be put into words. And that's why it's being done in an image or a metaphor. So I love that Michelle uh, uh, asserted that. <clears throat> now, another aspect, uh, the context in which Michelle was asserting this as a value is quite interesting too. And basically it seemed to me that she was saying in her paper that not narrative poems, but poems that have in some ways a somewhat anarchic, um, imagistic, disorganized surface, an associative uh, uh, train of thought, which leaps from image to image, leaping is an important word, <clears throat> leaps from image to image without having to remain consistent to a narrative frame, you know. So my dog and I went for a walk, um, and then <clears throat> the poem that leaps is, is suddenly talking about um, how uh, subway trains in Japan are made from metal that was harvested from the wreckage of Nagasaki. And, you know, we never even have to come back to the dog and the field and the narrator, you know, um, because this is a leaping associate poet. I'm going to read you a little passage from Michelle's 
um, essay. She says, ironically enough, she's been talking about narrative. I find that contemporary lyrical poetry, which is something she opposes or counterposes to narrative poetry, leaps far more than narrative poetry. Lyrical poetry will venture across the ocean and back again in the span of two or three lines. It will talk about a familial relationship in one line and then about a pet dog and basket of lemons and then a pair of smelly gym shoes all in one stanza. Lyrical poetry relies on the reader leaping from image to image without noting any specific story continuing throughout. Poems that are narrative have the ability to stay in one place in one moment <clears throat> and to explore all the different images and emotions that lay in that space and so forth and so on. Um, uh, so the poetic supernatural is, is, is sort of the, 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 the phrase that she uses. So this is basically an aesthetic that values the, the subjective, the internal, the psychic, the emotional life, which is expressed in images more than the rational, the um, omniscient, the discursive narrator. Okay, the, the, not the poem that's about the world, but in a way, the poem in which the internal world and the external world are in a way continuous and contiguous and sort of fusing with each other, right? Okay, so let's call this, I'm going to call this the aesthetic of the disorganized psyche. When a poem is disorganized, when it leaps from image to image, when even its syntax is broken, and it presents itself in the form of fragments. Basically, there is a paradigm, a representational paradigm at work. And basically, the message to the reader is, I, the speaker of the poem or the maker of the poem, am so overwhelmed by my feeling, I am so intensely inside my own subjectivity that, um, that I can't actually make complete grammar. I cannot tell you what my thesis statement is. I'm not going to be speaking la rationally. I'm going to be speaking compulsively because I have to. I'm obsessed. These images are welling up inside me one after the other, and I'm just the conduit for them. So when a poem is fragmentary or when it's disorganized on the surface of, uh, of the page um, in lower case letters and, and fragments are sort of swirling around or scattered around spatially, or the images are discontinuous, so forth and so on. It's basically claiming my aesthetic is intensity. Emotional intensity is what I'm about. That's where I live, and that's what my poetry is about, right? So, this is a pretty fashionable. Um, uh, this is a pretty fashionable position right now, and you'll find in many of the magazines and many of the books that are being published, you'll find often even a superficially unnecessarily non-required disorganized appearance on the page because it's cool, because it's hipster, because it looks chaotic, because it makes a claim to emotional intensity, and because that's the kind of poem that's kind of in now, okay? This kind of poetry um, technically is philosophically opposed to rationality, to careful, meticulous, step-by-step -step thinking. It kind of scorns that. It's much more chaotic, anarchic. Another common word for it is Dionysian. Dionysius who rips himself apart, you know. Um, Dionysius who tears civilization apart and, and is not interested in being a civilized spo a spokesperson for civilization, but is interested in being a spokesperson for the intensely subjective psyche, which is happening, you know, at a pretty high velocity, all right? But often that's a pretty superficial appearance that's being given to the page aesthetically. And I'm going to show you an example of this uh, taken from a recent magazine. And um, I'm going to hold it up to the screen. You, you'll have this um, as a handout, but I just want you to read it if you can, all right? And I'm going to try to read it to you. Here's what it looks like on the page. Pretty sexy, huh? The work, simple. Uh, multiple random uh, parenthetical mark. The work, simple, the bullshit, simple, limited natural talent or endurance, chain of tasks. Some of us help each other. Some of us are liars. 
way to the future, loose grasp, um, transparency, ideas without a process. Um, uh, ideas without a process, shit. So hard to do this. Um, uh, how to put the charge into powered objects. Let the thing see you. Foam. Know what else? Maybe anciently prefigured this pool. A pebble in the gullet. A sour cancer. <clears throat> um, uh, sour cancer. Um, the American imaginary. Oh, wow, that's exciting. It's going to be writing about the American imaginary. No, never. But I know you. You're the same guy. White gangsters wear ties in the white imagination. Otherwise, imp compulsory. Otherwise, lacking insurance. Over 50. Body wrecked service. <clears throat> then, reporting for duty. Unsatisfied. You still have not heard me. Okay? So, um, this is a chaotic poem. It presents a highly disorganized surface. Um, it's, uh, it's got premises. It's disorganized for the purposes of, of, seem, of, of, be, of emotional intensity. It's, um, it, it's uh, simple grammar and fragments has force, distress, extremity, but it forsakes the power of precise relations. In other words, we don't know what the fuck is happening in the poem. <clears throat> we don't really know who the speaker is. We don't know if there's a subject matter. The speaker is is throwing a bunch of jigsaw puzzle pieces from different jigsaw puzzles and saying, here, you put it together. This is my, um, this is my rant, okay? Um, but it really is, I'm sorry to say, and it doesn't mean that the person who wrote it, and I don't even know who wrote it, um, is a bad person, but this is not actually a real poem. It has no power of precise relations whatsoever. It doesn't mean that poems that are disorganized or fragmentary can't be truly powerful, but they still have some responsibilities in terms of meaning, in terms of <clears throat> the images belonging to a kind of coherent family relations. Uh, um, <clears throat> they can leap all over the place, but there's a way in which we assume of the highly associative poem and that's an important aesthetic term. The associated poem is that, <clears throat> is that the relationships between the parts are deducible by a skilled reader, okay? Is that the mind, the mind leaps, our minds do leap, our thinking process, our mentation, our feelings and our thoughts, they, they are discontinuous and associative. They don't have transitions. They aren't reasonable, you know? We really are a, a pretty chaotically bunch of primates, you know, monkeys with car keys. But but there still is, in a, in a good associated poem, um, as I will be showing you, uh, there still is a certain kind of allegiance to a framework um, and to the integrity of the psyche, okay? Uh, otherwise, the people in insane asylums would be our greatest poets. Um, but those people are, are, are fragmented. Um, the job of the poet is not just to be fragmented. The job of the poet is, well, we won't even get into that. So the aesthetic of disorganization is a fashionable aesthetic. It can, it, it, it can be evident in superficial ways on the page in its textuality. It can be evident in, uh, in, it, in its associative stream of consciousness so forth and so on. I mean, T.S. Eliot is the 20th century poet who was best known for validating a uh, dissociative process. Um, the underlying thesis of his poems, The Wasteland and Proof Rock, was that the self is broken and, and, and modernity has broken the world into fragments. And that's why he says, you know, against my ruins, I've shored these fragments. Um, uh, so, uh, it's a legitimate aesthetic and some of my favorite poets, uh, practice it in various kinds of ways. Now, I want to show you, uh, a poem, uh, 
which is sort of related to this aesthetic. And, and um, <clears throat> this is uh, one of Michelle's poems from a week or two ago. Um, Michelle is an impressionistic poet. She is an associative poet. Um, I like her aesthetic very much. And I like this poem that I'm going to show you a good deal. You'll find, by the way, I apologize in advance, I'm using your poems for my own aesthetic purposes. Um, uh, it just seems they're right there, and they are manifesting um, our, our aesthetics uh, in a way that is very immediate. And, and uh, since we are all students, we all have a disease called uh, not knowing everything, okay? Um, and we're trying to learn more to become more conscious craftspeople. So I guess another thing you could say about the aesthetics of disorganization is that it values the unconscious more than the conscious, right? All of these distinctions, these binaries, these polarities, these aesthetic oppositions, they already are familiar to you. But to have their vocabulary and to be able to use them in your critical discussions and in writing your papers, is crucially important for you to be able to learn from the poems of other people and then to internalize those lessons that you have articulated and then to become a better poet yourself, okay? So the poems we see in workshop, I never see them as finished products. They rarely are perfect. My drafts are hardly perfect. I work on poems for very long periods of time before they cohere and nine out of ten never do cohere because I can't uh, marshal the continuity of representation of my thought feeling process or whatever my subject matter is. So I'm going to hold up Michelle's poem and I'm going to read it to you. And um, I want to make the point that this is, an, this is a narrative poem. It ha practices the aesthetic imagination. Imagination is its dominant temperament. Um, uh, it's uh, psychically intense, personal, its materials are, 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 are emotional and quite interesting. So I'm going to try to hold it in a, in, in a, at a distance that's legible to you. So you can read along as I read from it. I'm terrible at this. I'm going to have to figure out a better way to do it, but I haven't yet. Anyway, you have this poem. Here's the poem. Narrative with infidelity and longing. And, and, and notice the, the, thir the narrative thoroughness uh, with which this poem uh, begins. I think it's uh, really uh, very well done. Narrative with infidelity and longing. I couldn't remember which cab to hail, which spells to cast, or on which blocks to bury to parts of m myself, on which blocks to bury to parts of myself, the parts of myself probably, that disappeared at the thought of how many women you touched and believed were more beautiful than me. Okay, so much clarity here. We're in a physical setting in the external world. We, uh, the, the personal themes have been introduced. Um, the, the jilted or unappreciated lover um, and uh, so forth. On. I stood outside of your apartment again in the snow more times than you asked, because obsession rarely allows you to keep any of who you were before. All right? Great. I only wanted to be the mother of something, of something like a fawn split open in the forest, inanimate but alive. I waited, and the red grew from me like I was birthing it. I wanted to show you tricks with a fresh deck of cards. I wanted to pull things from you like ribbons from the smooth wrists of a magician, all right? So many, uh, many fine things here, uh, uh, quite visible. And, uh, and you'll see that the, that the beginning of the poem is the, is the firmest and in a way uh, the, best, the best written, the most coherent. This is where Michelle is practicing the narrative mode, but the, the narrative mode with, with a lot of imagination in it too, okay? Um, and a lot of speed, which is something that, that her aesthetic values, a lot of speed, you know, where we're getting so much narrative compressed and delivered quickly, you know, that the, that the lover who's, 
apartment the speaker is standing outside has had many other women and and believe them more beautiful than the speaker and the speaker is standing out in the snow forlorn and uh aware self-aware that she is the victim of her own romantic obsession which will probably come to no good but um but nonetheless and you see in stanza three there's this wonderful intensification emotional intensification i wanted to be the mother of something and this very strong image like a fawn split open in the forest inanimate but alive i waited and the red grew from me like i was birthing it so what we see in those two stanzas three and four is a movement to the interior of the psyche where images are actually correlatives for emotional states no longer correlatives for things in the outside narrative world but with the inner world so they're very intense and then in the last two stanzas i wanted to show you tricks with a fresh deck of cards i wanted to pull things from you like ribbons from and what you see here is basically the speaker leaping if you will to another kind of categories uh, uh, other categories of of metaphors and figures of speech deck of cards magicians but you can see that there's quite a bit of discontinuity between um between the first four stanzas of the poem which go uh very well i think um and then the speaker is trying to solve the problems that the poem has constructed if you're building the poem and you're building it well in fact it gets harder and harder as you go along because you've limited the possibilities you've constructed a narrative or a discourse and a world which has certain kinds of rules certain kinds of themes and problems which you then are under the obligation to resolve which means that your options get more and more limited at the beginning of a poem a poem can be quite freely associative because anything can come in the reader is very tolerant but if the reader is a good reader the reader is aware of these uh of these significant moments and that these kinds of structural obligations that the writer is committing herself to or himself to so we can see uh certain kinds of intensities we've got the narrative frame we completely understand the narrative situation we see intensities in the image of this fawn which is a kind of wonderful image of vulnerability and then we see the color red which is both rage both rage and also woundedness which is intensifying so we know that really that's where the poems uh emotional in emotionally most intense moments has happened right here kind of in the center of the poem and now the poem has to resolve itself and the poem doesn't really know how to resolve itself and so it actually jumps to another category of metaphor and even a whole other tonality so in our discussions of metaphor we've been talking about some of the key and compression we've been talking about the ways in which tone is key to sort of understanding uh the narrative of a poem and also understanding sort of the the rules of the game that are being presented now i'm just going to pause